Excellent. Okay, so good morning and welcome to uh, this morning's webinar, Going Beyond the Background Check, Incorporating Safe Practices in Volunteer Programs. And this is a special webinar for the Mentoring Partnership of Southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, my name is Sarah Kremer, and I am a board certified and registered art therapist and program director here at Friends for Youth Mentoring Institute. Uh, we are in Northern California, so it's a little bit early for me, but uh, so far, so good today. And I do want to thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to share our, uh, our information and our resources about SAFE uh, with you because it is such an important topic. Um, and we know that you realize this because you're having me talk to you about it and, and share you share with you what we've learned. Uh, so we're going to have a presentation. Uh, I'll be speaking and showing you some slides for about an hour, and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions. Uh, and as I said before, if you have any questions as we go through, go ahead and type them in the question panel. Uh, since it's just me, I may get on a little bit of a track with the presentation, but I'll try to keep looking over at the question panel and make sure I'm, I'm getting everyone. Uh, but today we're going to look at two, two big parts of, of what we consider is really important for this topic, uh, looking at screen, the purpose and relevance, which is screening for effectiveness and screening for safety, and then look at some very specific screening strategies, uh, including tools, what we call informed intuition, red flags, and then a little bit at the end in terms of teamwork, training, and supervision. Um, and before I start, does anyone have any questions, any kind of burning questions, or maybe there's something that you hope that we'll cover? If you want to go ahead and type that in, and if not, we will just keep going. Okay, so we're going to start with part one, talking about screening for effectiveness and screening for safety. So in general, we do have to talk about this. This is a really important topic, and I, I'm happy to say that since I've been doing these presentations over the last five years, that we've seen uh, more and more emphasis on sc specific screening uh, beyond the background check. That's why we call our presentation that. Um, most programs, uh, when we started producing, when we produced SAFE in 2006, and I started doing trainings on it, um, we have had this training in some form for the previous five years. Uh, most programs would say, no, we're okay, we're good, we, um, we do a background check on our volunteers. And there's a lot more that, that needs to happen in order to make sure that, that a volunteer is safe enough to be around a young person in a program. Uh, so as you can see here, here's some quotes from some recent research, um, that especially in terms of effectiveness, that you have to have more than good intentions and volunteers ready to go. Um, we know that if, if the right mentor is not in place, uh, you can see a lot of, of, of pretty drastic uh, negative outcomes from that. So when you're looking at screening for effectiveness, you're looking at a, a number of things here. We're going to go through uh, some general concepts right now, and then at the end, you'll see where I weave these back into the specific tool that we're looking at. So you want to find out, does this volunteer really have the time necessary to do this? Um, are they thinking that uh, they can squeeze it in, or maybe they're being unrealistic about, about being able to meet this commitment? Will they be able to follow through? Uh, and one way you can see that is if a volunteer can follow through with the application process. Um, usually it takes, in our program, it's anywhere between one month and two months. Uh, for someone to get all the way through, and a lot of that has to do with the timing for the w what we expect from the applicant. Um, so there are some people who really just drop off and they don't continue, and some of that is they're deciding not to continue, but I know we have had volunteers, uh, potential volunteers, who have started the process and just really weren't able to continue, uh, con continue turning in forms and, and getting things done. And that's really indicative of how they might be with a, a young person, too. If you're looking at specific characteristics and skills, which we'll go over in a little bit, too, are they open to learning? And that's really important, because if you have someone come in who's, who's already decided, you know, I really know how to do this, um, you're going to have a lot of problems with, with them later, uh, because they'll, find, they'll end up in a situation where they really don't know what to do, but they may be unable to ask for help. 
are they able to work within the program guidelines? Um, that's really important. You'll see that come up in the screening process. If someone can, uh, can follow your process, then there's a really good likelihood that they'll be able to follow your program's guidelines. And you'll see, um, I'll give some examples of, of volunteers who have really pushed that, that limit, that boundary of, of what you're saying they need to do, and they try to, to make you change your process to fit their needs. And that can be an example of, of someone who really will push the process later on as well. Uh, you're looking at ability to set limits and boundaries, especially with that young person. And do they have a really solid sense of themselves? That's something that they can, they, they can really feel, feel secure in themselves enough to, to be there for a young person. So those are some general kinds of things we're starting to take a look at. The right mentor attitude. Uh, this is, these are little bits from research on what's really going to make a difference. Uh, so you can see here that they understand about the relationship, that that's the only reason why they're there is to build that relationship, that they're responsible for it. They can't expect their mentee to just call them because <laughs> uh, we know that sometimes that doesn't really happen. Uh, that they also really respect that young person and, and where he or she is coming from. Um, they're willing to help them through their issues, uh, but if you go one below that, they know that they cannot solve all of those problems. So some of that comes through in, when you do mentor training is to help them really make, help them make sure their, their expectations are realistic uh, and that they can also rely on the program for support. That goes back to being open to learning and knowing that the program is there with answers for them. These are some other qualities that we've pulled out from different pieces of research to say, you know, what, what exactly are you looking for? Uh, and I'll be able to share with you a, a form that we have uh, that we use as kind of like a, not necessarily a checklist, but more of a guideline to, to prompt the discussion to figure out, is, does this person really have what we're looking for? So you can see on here, emotionally balanced, non-judgmental attitude. They hold unconditional, hopeful, positive regard for the young person. They're able to share their life stories appropriately. They're sensitive and responsive to issues of individual youth or the general youth population. Sometimes we have volunteers who really don't have a lot of experience with youth, uh, except for maybe being a young person themselves, and that's okay. But as long as they're open to, to, those, um, to those issues and open to being able to, to talk with their mentee about it, that's, that's okay with us. Uh, you're looking for somebody who's extremely flexible. Uh, someone who's able to see the potential, not just the faults of that young person, and most importantly, able to maintain boundaries. So hold on to some of those things. We'll come back to the end, because uh, now we're going to look at, <coughs> excuse me, the idea of screening for effect, uh, screening for safety. Uh, this is a quote from a psychologist who's worked with uh, child molesters and child predators up in Canada, uh, and he has said that uh, from the the men that he's worked with, uh, definitely they're looking to get into programs because that's where they are. And he's also saying that this is, uh, we also have a, a large number of vulnerable youth who are already uh, kind of open to that kind of uh, experience. Um, and I don't mean that they're choosing to be open, but maybe they have been molested in the past, maybe they've been victimized in some way, and they seem to be more vulnerable to that. Um, it's always an extremely uncomfortable topic in all the trainings I've done. Um, there have been people who have walked out, so uh, and, and most of the time when I've done an in-person training, it's hard to tell when I'm doing a webinar, but uh, when I do an in-person training, there's always at least one person who will come up to me later and say, you know, I was molested when I was a young person, um, and this is bringing up a lot of things for me. So it's, it's, very, it's very heavy to, to really think that this is something that could happen in your program. So I appreciate everyone being here to, to, to really address this and, and to be comfortable with it. And, and to, to know, too, that the more you talk about this, the easier it gets. And it's, it's a, um, it just kind of settles in. Uh, and, and you become more comfortable with being able to talk about it and to know that it's a possibility. So I think that that leaves you open to uh, being able to see something that could happen. Um, generates a lot of anxiety and fear. Um, because it is a potential danger for young people, and that's, you know, we're looking at a 180 degree uh, difference of why we want to help young people. 
and significant liability for an organization if something like this happens. Um, I don't need to go into too much of this. There's a lot of information out there on what could happen if a young person is sexually abused. And I would also recommend that if you haven't already to contact your local Child Abuse Prevention Council for some training, um, not only for mandated reporting, but just kind of get familiar if you're not already with what could happen um, if a young person is sexually abused. So basically, when we talk about screening for safety, we're looking at a couple things. And they, see, they may seem really obvious, which is true, uh, but we want to make sure that uh, you're really answer, being able to answer these questions honestly. Um, you're looking for a candidate who will not endanger the life of the mentee, who demonstrates good judgment, <clears throat> who has a safe home environment if this is something that your program allows. Uh, if it's a site-based or school-based program and they are, they're not seeing each other outside of that environment, it may not come up, um, but you also may not have any control over them seeing each other outside of the, uh, outside of the program. And then lastly, making sure this candidate will not be physically, mentally, sexually, or verbally abusive. Uh, and throughout the presentation, I have a few case studies sprinkled in here. This is, uh, came out in April 2008 um, called Who's Lending a Hand? A National Survey of Nonprofit Volunteer Screening Practices. Uh, and this was from a, a national group that did a, a telephone survey. And this was for nonprofits using any kind of volunteers, not just for youth serving programs. But I still think it's important that they found 12% of these programs did not screen volunteers at all. Uh, and this could be, I'm hoping it's actually more of the uh, like food pantry or some other kind of uh, program where there's not too much con contact and, and uh, interaction with other people. But some of the reasons they said is that it's not useful, it costs too much, it may offend potential volunteers, and I've heard that from other programs too, where they, they almost feel guilty asking volunteers to, to go through a process to check them out. So if anybody's thinking that, I hope by the end of the presentation I'll have changed your mind so that you approach potential volunteers with the expectation of, we, we know that you care about young people in our community, so we, we know that you'll be willing to go through this process to make sure our young people stay safe. Uh, and at the bottom, 50% of those who were surveyed reported that screening did identify an inappropriate candidate. So um, it's almost sort of the answer to the problem at the top. If it's not useful, um, more than half the people who do it actually found that it was useful. And here in Northern California, we did a, a te telephone survey about two years ago. And we uh, called you, just youth serving programs who use volunteers. And we found some really good statistics, 97% screen volunteers in some way. Uh, and that 82% reported screen, that screening has identified inappropriate candidates. Uh, so we've, I've done a lot of trainings here on, uh, in our county and in this area. So I feel pretty good uh, about getting the word out there. And if you're interested, you can go on our website and download that full report. So the priority in screening is to keep children in programs safe. Uh, volunteer support is certainly important and you want to make sure your volunteers know what to do because they are the intervention. Um, but it's really about serving young people. So once you have this mindset, it becomes clear what you'll need to do. When I do a longer in-person training, I also like to, to show a couple videos. Um, Oprah Winfrey has done so many amazing shows on child molesters. Um, she has one from 2002. I think she did a couple more in between there. Uh, but that one is really good. And then just this past winter and spring, she had three episodes devoted to uh, kind of interviewing and really sitting down and talking with convicted child molesters. Uh, so I don't know if anyone there has seen those shows, but I highly recommend that you go through. You can use this for uh, staff training, but to sit down and, and talk, listen to the shows. Um, she, she's pretty cool for most of the time. It's every now and then. Um, she does a little bit of her outrage es escapes, and uh, she might be a little inappropriate, but you can understand when that, where that's coming from. Uh, so get together, watch it, and then talk about the, the kinds of things that were coming up for everybody uh, and the kind of red flags that you heard them talk about. Uh, that's a great, uh, great staff training tool. This is another one that I like to use. Um, this is a documentary made uh, in 94, and this is 
called Chicken Hawk, Men Who Love Boys. And this director decided to follow uh, members of NAMBLA, which is the North American Man-Boy Love Association. And that was uh, one of the biggest organized groups that promoted um, what, what we would call sexual abuse of youth. Uh, and they would call romantic relationships with young people. And it wasn't available um, in a, for, you know, for a wider audience. Uh, I got a tape of mine from a police detective. But you c I did hear someone said that they do have clips on YouTube. So you can go look that up. And, and I would say go through it again with staff <clears throat> and see what kind of red flags that you're seeing with these people. And I'm sorry, we have uh, a lot of allergies that are allergy season out here again. So I may have to stop a few minutes. <clears throat> OK, so uh, perpetrators. We know that uh, most of them are known by the child and the family. Most of those are come from within the family, but the remainder are people who are somehow connected to the family, teachers, coaches, neighbors, and even mentors. Um, these are some recent uh, articles that I've, I've pulled from our local area. Gem teacher, a volunteer with a church program, substitute teacher, a uh, former nurse uh, in San Diego, a math teacher, and a scout leader. So, these, you know, this is very typical of, of what's happening in most communities is that these are adults who are trusted to, to work with youth uh, and to support them and, and are doing things that, that we don't want them to. We also see some instances of volunteer mentors. Um, I collect, I have a huge, getting thicker every year, a big binder of news articles that come up. Um, and these are some of the ones where it has been either a of an actual volunteer mentor or someone who is acting in that capacity. So you can see um, there was an executive director, a counselor mentor, a public school mentor advocate, public school coach mentor, uh, caseworker mentor, and in this case, um, this uh, particular person was actually a registered sex offender. And he um, he was, uh, sorry, I had to check. I wasn't sure if the sound was coming through, and it is. Uh, he is a registered sex offender who somehow was not, uh, that information didn't come up when he first started working for a social service agency in that area. And what happened was that agency ended up merging with another one, and they rescreened everybody. They found this information. They terminated his employment right away. And what this guy did is he went back to some of the families that he was working with approached them individually and said, you know, I'm, I'm not working there anymore, but I can still work with your, with your children. Um, I can be a mentor to them kind of unofficially. And of course, these families had no idea what had happened, and they trusted him because of his previous experience with them, and then he ended up assaulting uh, several boys. And we see a, a church mentor that was kind of informal, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters mentor in Oklahoma, <clears throat> and I've spoken with people from that program. And um, they said it was just, it was pretty horrific uh, what happened. And they have a really good screening process. So um, sometimes people do get through. Church minister, uh, big pal, little pal program, and a partner's mentor. So young people who, uh, who, who are in these programs, they're targeted in general, <clears throat> as most young people are, because they're less credible. They're curious about sex. They want to please. Uh, they're looking for attention or affection. Sometimes they're taught to obey adults, so they wouldn't, once a, an adult uh, uses some kind of coercion, they're not going to tell on them. And in the end, after the abuse has happened, they may end up wanting to protect the offender because they're getting something else from that relationship. These are some generally <clears throat> accepted statistics. Uh, one out of every four to five girls one out of every six to ten boys, although that number is probably higher. Uh, and boys are more likely than girls to be abused by someone outside of their family, uh, which is important because I think most mentoring programs have more boys than girls in them. So something to be, to be really careful of. Victim victimization rates are pretty constant from three years old and up. So that means there's not really a specific age where young people are most vulnerable. Although they do say that between 7 and 13, young people, it's kind of like a peak area. And that's usually because these are young people who are uh, either going through puberty or pre-pubescent. Pre and that seems to be something that's 
um, enticing to child molesters and child predators. Uh, it usually occurs before 16 in most cases. Uh, they are vulnerable, isolated, or lonely. It's usually why they're in our programs. Uh, in addition, usually lacking some kind of adult supervision and protection. But no matter how many of these protective factors they have, uh, all young people are at risk uh, because the seduction techniques that child molesters use are really sophisticated. So even parents who have had conversations with their children and, and counselors who have really supportive relationships, sometimes abuse can go on uh, for a long time without anyone knowing. In terms of our programs, um, we face a number of obstacles in this area. Uh, and primarily because the ideal victim for child molesters is, is our client. Uh, this is who we're serving. These are young people who are all of those, uh, all of those things. They're lonely. They're vulnerable. Uh, they really want to get to know and have support from an adult. As programs, we gain the trust of parents. Uh, I'm not sure how it works in your programs, but um, I've had, when I was working in our direct services program for four years, uh, and I probably did um, somewhere between two and 300 uh, youth interviews uh, with mentees and their parents. I had maybe half a dozen parents actually ask me about the screening process for the mentors. Uh, parents are just really, you know, they're overwhelmed, they're overworked, they're ready to sign up, and they may not also know what kind of questions to ask. Most programs face some kind of pressure to meet goal numbers. There's not very much training or literature available. If you have high turnover rates, and most programs do because most of the direct, uh, direct services staff come right out of college, uh, maybe they stay a few years, they decide to go back to school, they move on to another career, um, there's a lot of difficulty with monitoring. And if something does happen, agencies are likely to conceal, uh, to conceal that something happened to avoid liability and loss of credibility. Um, this can, something like this can really close a whole program down. And it's actually a, law, a low priority for law enforcement. And I heard that directly from law enforcement. So I know that that's, that's actually true. So thinking to yourself, um, knowing about the, 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 how young people are targeted and the statistics involved with this, what does this say about the rates of victimization within the young people in your program? Do you actually ask? mentees about sexual victimization? And the flip side to that is, would you know that history even if you would ask? Uh, and I would say that for most programs, even if they do ask, they may not find out of this information for quite a while. Uh, young people are really not, may not feel really good about asking or, or, or sharing this information, uh, so they may wait a while before they, they get to trust somebody to say anything about it. Something to think about and discuss later. So let's get into the, the meat of what we're talking about here. These are really what you can do within your program. And usually when I'm doing an in-person uh, training or webinar when everybody's logged in uh, separately, uh, I usually like to do a couple little polls and find out how many people are doing each one of these things. So um, this could be something you could use later on to find out how many of these steps uh, are included in your, your own program's application process. Um, so let me first say that this training is, uh, should not be viewed as the re rendering of legal advice. Uh, I am not a lawyer and we are not a legal agency. Uh, so we really encourage you to consult your own legal counsel. Maybe it's an advisory board. Uh, hopefully you do have some kind of lawyer on, uh, on contract with, with your agency and make sure that it meets all of the nonprofit and state law standards uh, that you need to have for your particular program. But in general, I will say that every uh, program who uses volunteers has the legal right to accept, reject, or terminate candidates at your discretion. It's entirely up to you. There are no limitations on what information you can ask from volunteers, but there may be limitations on who can view this information and how it's stored. And that especially comes into play when we start talking about the actual background checks uh, that come from either the state or the federal, federal agencies uh, where it has a lot of identifying information. Every candidate must go through the same process no matter who told them about the program. So 
So when your, uh, your president of the board of directors comes to you and says, so this is my neighbor, Mary. Uh, she's very excited about the program. I've been talking to her about it for years, and she now finally has time in her schedule. So she's going to show up on Tuesday and become a mentor with you. Uh, does anybody know what you say? And you can type that in, or have Arlene type that in for you. That gonna work a little. We'll try a little interaction here. Exactly. Everyone has to go through the same process. Uh, so you you let your uh, the president know. Thank you so much for for meeting your recruitment goals. Um, this is this is very an important part of your job. But act, exactly as as Arlene just typed in. Mary the neighbor can't just show up. Uh, here's the first step in our process. Um, and we invite her to go through this thing too. And even if it's the president of, the, of your board of directors, um, even, even if it's another staff, I became a mentor in our program. And I went through every step as well. Uh, although they did let me get out of the training because I had designed the training. So I was OK not doing that part. But uh, someone else came to my home for the interview. Um, I was already on file with the, the background checks. Uh, fingerprint based, but everything check, they called my references, um, had to turn in my B&B, &B. I did everything. Make sure that the volunteer application process should uh, is completed and documented before the candidate is accepted. Uh, and make sure that everybody feels okay about the decision. Um, I, ha I still encounter programs that say, well, you know, we were really close uh, to getting all of the paperwork in, but you know, the program was starting, we had this young person in mind, and we really just wanted to get it going, so we let this mentor start. What happens if uh, that young person, or the, the applicant, you get something back that you don't like? What happens to that young person? Um, they end up having another failed relationship in their life, which is not something we want to do. So make sure you get all the way through the process. And after this person is accepted and introduced to the mentee, uh, you know from just looking at those articles, uh, or the, the headings of those articles that I, I showed you, the relationship must continue to be monitored. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So in terms of your actual screening process, uh, we like to talk about non-negotiables. So is there anyone right now who has, I'll go back, so you, don't, you can't uh, peek. Um, what kind of non-negotiables does your do your programs have? Um, and if you can go ahead and ask Arlene to type this in, please. Maybe just a couple examples of of what if anything comes up in in this area or that says this, we absolutely will not accept this candidate no matter what. And let's see what you come up with. Okay, so I see here all volunteers must be fingerprinted. Excellent. Uh, but in terms of like, you know, if something showed up or something happened, uh, some information that you discover during the process. Um, so child abuse clearances must be obtained. And I'm assuming what you're talking about too is that uh, the fingerprint results must be acceptable and that the uh, uh, results from the child abuse clearance is acceptable. Anything else? Anyone else have anything where you say, if this comes up, there's no way we're accepting this person? See if you have anything else. And I'm sure, um, I'm sure most of your programs do have these kinds of things, but you may not be thinking of it in this way. OK, so let's move on. Here's some examples of uh, what we would, might call non-negotiable disqualifiers. Uh, prior history of abuse of children, sexual and otherwise, so that absolutely, well, I will say hopefully show up on your uh, background checks, it may not. Conviction of other crime involving children, a history of extreme violence or sexually exploitive behavior, uh, termination from a paid or volunteer position because of misconduct with a child, 
failure to disclose a felony conviction, especially if related to violence, abuse, or children. Uh, DUI or DWI within the last three, five, or seven years. Um, some programs kind of go, uh, that's generally accepted numbers that I've seen, uh, but some programs will say 10 years as well. Um, and, you know, and you'll know it makes a difference if uh, someone had a DUI within the last two years and someone who had a DUI 20 years ago uh, when they were a younger person. Um, and also, if one staff member has any kind of uneasiness or uh, just really unsure about this applicant, um, we say that that should be a non-negotiable disqualifier. Then you have another kind of gray area here, and that's what we call mitigating circumstances. Um, so if somebody does have a record, maybe it's the nature of the offense. Maybe it really doesn't have anything to do with children or youth. Uh, how long ago the offense occurred, um, what the level of the offense was, uh, what happened because of it. Maybe they were acquitted, uh, what kind of sentence they received, um, if there were any other offenses within that record. And then was there any kind of completion of, of whatever that recommendation was made so that person can deal with this issue. Um, so it, it's, and you may not have anything specific about this. Uh, again, this is a good example of if someone had a DUI within the last two years or someone had a DUI 20 years ago. Uh, and I will say being in Northern California, we have had some applicants um, who were arrested at protest rallies <laughs> back in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, that's, that's not the same kind of record um, that we would be concerned about as if someone had a, a violent episode or something really having to do with children. So this is, the, uh, this is what we are looking at in terms of the application process. Um, this is how it all comes together in a, in a nice visual format. So in the middle you see this is your final decision. This is, and everything around it is what you're, you're taking materials from and information from to come to that final decision. And we'll go through each one of these. This is going to look like a lot, and we're going to go through these uh, somewhat quickly, um, but this webinar is being recorded, so you'll have access to come back to this again, as well as view the slides on your own so that you'll be able to, to, be able to write these down. Uh, and I will say that all of this information is also included in our book, Safe, Screening Applicants for Effectiveness, um, that we'll talk about at the end, too. So what is this idea of informed intuition? It's basically, how do you know when a volunteer applicant is just not right for your program? Uh, so if you could ask uh, Arlene to type in, um, what are some things that you've ever noticed where you just thought, you know, this, is, this isn't right? I'm not sure what it is, or I do know what it is. It's this, and it's not okay for our program. Uh, and it's not any kind of factual information that you find from a background check, uh, but it's just something you're sensing. So if, if anyone has any ideas, if you could ask, Arlene to type that in, please. Okay, I see suspicious vocabulary used in the interview. Excellent. Evading questions about your background. Very good. Uh, I did an interview with um, an older woman who um, was having a lot of difficulty talking about her childhood um, and really just would not like refused to discuss anything having to do with her growing up period. Uh, and then she became a little hostile and said, why do you need to know this information? Uh, this is none of your business. And at that point, we decided just to not continue. And one, uh, I see Arlene typing in. In one instance, a potential volunteer seemed too eager to volunteer with interacting with youth. Excellent. Um, we also had someone show up at our information session, which is the very first point of contact outside of what they may have learned from on our website. Um, he showed up with his uh, DMV record. Um, he was filling out the application as he was waiting for the information session to start. Uh, afterwards, he wanted to set up his interview in two days and come to the training that was the following weekend. Uh, so that person really got on the slow track of all of those steps. Um, we did not accept them in the end. Okay, great ideas. So it's this idea of informed intuition. Uh, and this is a quote from, um, he's now a sergeant with the San Francisco Police Department, and he spent a couple years in the Child Exploitation Unit 
and he's done uh, several trainings with me and it has really informed um, informed me about what what's happening with with these child molesters. Uh, he actually went undercover uh, as as a predator in a number of cases, um, and you have to rotate out of those assignments pretty quickly because you can you can burn out pretty pretty fast. Uh, but he says I've investigated hundreds of child predator cases involving thousands of victims. In the case of every single victim, there was a woman, a mother agency staff teacher, who looked back and said, I thought something wasn't right. I had a funny feeling about him. Uh, now Steve has also come back and told me he didn't really say it was about being a woman. Uh, <laughs> he's trying to, to soften that blow a little bit. But he does, uh, he does agree that there are, the um, uh, majority of women are, are able to pick up on some of these things probably a little bit uh, better than, than men which is not to say that, I don't know if there are any men in the room, and my apologies, uh, but it doesn't mean that you cannot see these things or you can't learn how to spot them. Okay, so what we're saying in our, in our, uh, in our book, uh, throughout all of our presentations, that really the most important factor is about using your informed intuition, because that's going to give you a whole lot more information very quickly than all of the application steps combined. So a little bit of research on intuition. Um, it says that in general, intuition is a judgment that appears quickly in your consciousness. You're not fully aware of your underlying reasons, but it is strong enough to act upon. So think about those times when you've encountered volunteers where you just knew something wasn't right, uh, and you went ahead and came up with some, some thought. Uh, that's where this intuition comes from. And what I like is that it has its own rationale, which means, uh, if you look at number two, it's evolved through extended practice, uh, or it, it evolves uh, different capacities of your brain. So that means the more interviews that you do, the more likely you are going to be to pick up on some of these red flags, uh, to, to really hone in on that intuition. OK, these are some of the red flags we're going to go through. And uh, we're going to go through the next part pretty quickly where I'm, I'm kind of pulling together the tools that you can use and combining them with red flags in certain areas to see this is something you might see using this kind of tool. And I also have some examples in here as well. Uh, so first, to start off with, uh, we, we just say in general, think of interactions as a tool. Uh, this is something you want to, to be aware of any kind of contact with, with an applicant. Um, it's a great opportunity. So this might look like inappropriate or unusual questions or comments. Someone mentioned that already. Uh, response to screening process and requirements. Um, again, someone mentioned kind of an eagerness, uh, but you also might see a real resistance in someone who wants to um, wants to rewrite your your process just for themselves. And then after they've been matched, someone who might have inappropriate behavior with the mentee. So this is where you'll see red flags. And I'll say, too, about the red flags, uh, these are kind of general categories that our executive director, Becky Cooper, created when we first produced this resource. Uh, she has been here. She was the first staff hired here 31 years ago. And she struggled and over the years with, how do I know that this is an OK person? And it, I don't know if you'll remember back that far, but in 1979, you really couldn't go out and do a, a fingerprint-based or name-based background check. They really just didn't have that capability. Uh, so she paid a lot of attention to um, some of these kind of general areas where, where she felt like, you know, this just isn't right. Uh, and then once more information started becoming available about child molesters and child predators, kind of included that into, into our reasoning. Uh, but when we produced this book, she went back and looked through, um, at that point, 26 years of information on candidates who had been rejected from our program and came up with these with these general categories uh, to, to take a look at you may you may see something here and the presence of one of these does not mean that somebody is a child molester I want to be really clear about that this is not a checklist uh, this is not uh, this is not a, a, a specific science where you say oh okay they have three here that means that person is a child molester and you're not actually looking to prove that somebody is, is that of that persuasion or not. You're just looking to find out, is this person appropriate enough to be in our program? So uh, starting with the red flags, um, extreme behavior. We've talked about some of these. 
somebody who, who's impatient with the process, or somebody who's, who is overly cooperative, and somebody who's secretive about activity. Um, in terms of interactions, you'll, uh, this is my example, 90% of, of convicted child molesters are men. Um, the number of women is growing, but they're still perceived differently. So um, you want to be focusing on men who are interested in your program. But that does not mean that any woman who approaches you is going to be fine. Uh, so really think about it. And I have two uh, examples. On the left is Mary Kay Letourneau with uh, her students, who she um, ended up marrying after her after two stints in prison, um, and then Deborah Lefebvre from Florida, who's also a teacher. Uh, and in general, the response about these women was that um, there was you know, really nothing wrong with what they did. Um, and you're also not looking for anyone who is homosexual. That's a kind of a long-standing myth. I, I think it's starting to, to change a little bit. Uh, but the majority of accused abusers are recognizably heterosexual. And that's an example in there of someone out here. Um, there were two men who were arrested uh, together. They were roommates, and they had um, they molested um, probably hundreds of boys um, over their time together. And uh, it says that the man on the left, he uh, selected his future wife so he could molest her six-year-old son and later sexually assault their three-month-old infant. Um, so it's not someone who is by himself in, in most cases. Um, they're average Americans. Uh, you really can't identify or profile someone like this just by who they are, what they do, uh, in terms of you know the the kind of demographics that you can that you can learn about pretty easily. And if you've ever watched that show Dateline to Catch a Predator, uh, then you'll know that there's a, a really wide range of people who are who are doing these kind of behaviors. Okay, the next tool is about your program orientation or information session. Um, make sure when you when you go through this process is that you let everybody know all the screening steps and level of monitoring that gives them a chance to bow out if they see that you're actually going to go through all these steps. Uh, making sure that you say that all application material is confidential and becomes your property. Uh, again, looking for inappropriate or unusual questions or comments and responses to the screening process and requirements. In the information session, you may see some inappropriate behavior, uh, someone who's vague about how they learned of the program. Um, and sometimes people are not quite sure why this is, why this is important. Uh, but when you have someone who says, oh, yeah, I, I, I saw your program on the internet, uh, what you really want to know is, OK, did you see our ad, uh, online ad in the newspaper? Or did you see an article about us? Maybe you saw a listing on, I don't know if you use Craigslist out there. Uh, or maybe volunteer match, or did you see us listed on something like this? This is Boy Links, the Internet's most comprehensive listing of boy-related and boy-love websites. Uh, this is an actual screenshot that I took um, just about two years ago, uh, and I do not recommend that you go online and look for this information because the FBI does monitor this. Um, so unless you have a real need to do it uh, and you want to identify one computer in your program, as you know, the, this is where this information is, is uh, going to, um, you, you don't need to do it. Because all you need to know is that they are listing programs. Uh, you can see on here, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, Boy Scouts of America, Children Now. Uh, let's see the next page. Uh, Mentor is on here. Save the Children. There's also some that I have no idea what they do. YMCA, Youth Coalition. So these organizations have done nothing to get themselves on here. Um, and they can't do anything about it. There's, there's a lot of free speech um, action, uh, legal action, in terms of what they can put out there. And, and they do have a statement uh, above that talks about how this is for informational purposes and uh, it was not for intended for anyone to further abuse. Um, so they can put it there. So just know that that stuff is out there, but you want to find out how did you hear about our program. Okay, the next step is a written application, and this is a step that uh, I think almost every program I've ever spoken to uh, does use, and that's very important. Uh, it's a good starting point to learn about your applicant and to also make sure you can uh, find out uh, you know, written information, um, checking for inconsistencies with the other information that you're getting. 
And in our book, we have a sample volunteer written application that you are welcome to use. Uh, this was a, a case that happened, I think it was in Missouri. Uh, this was the man who had kidnapped two boys, uh, one first, and he had uh, kept him and molested him for a number of years. Uh, then the boy started approaching an older age. He wasn't that interested, so he kidnapped another one. And the younger boy uh, was able to escape the older boy, and they, they found out. Um, and just to say, like, no one noticed any red flags. Other than that, you had a 41-year-old guy who never dated or aspired to a career and who was quiet was a normal situation. Uh, and in my eyes, those are many red flags. Uh, but generally, people don't think about that. Uh, but according to this is a, a, a FBI behavioral analyst who's done a, a lot of great work on child molesters, those leading double lives, especially sex offenders, can become quite adept at compartmentalizing their behavior. So a person may look normal, have a job, work hard, go to church. Uh, these are things the average person is not trained to recognize. So I bring this in here to say you can have a written application. Uh, and you may see, OK, they have a job, they work hard, they go to church. But you, you need a lot more information than that. OK, the interview. Um, we recommend an extensive face-to-face -face interview to really examine that whole person's uh, life. Um, this is where your intuition really comes into play, because uh, you pick up on a lot of things just meeting someone. Um, and I've also experienced when I've uh, interviewed some candidates um, that I get a kind of funny feeling in my stomach, and something is just not right. Um, and that's, that's where I, I really build on my intuition. And in our book, we also have a sample volunteer interview that you're welcome to use. Um, this, these are some things that you may pick up on, uh, that, these are, that this applicant is someone who relates better to children uh, and talks about maybe be really wanting to listen to children, um, wanting to treat them as equal partners. Uh, they may talk about how many different um, uh, uh, hobbies or interests they have in working with children and youth. Um, they may kind of indicate that, that you know, some people may not understand them, uh, but what they're doing is right. I don't think I've actually had anyone who's ever come out and said that. Um, they're, they're usually a little more careful about that. Uh, but you may notice some sort of uh, rigidly held ideas about, you know, this is okay what I'm doing. Um, some information about uh, grooming that you may see come up um, when they start with the kind of grooming themselves, grooming the community. Uh, and you may hear about, you know, how many uh, other people in the community think of this person is an upstanding citizen. They've done so much for our community. I can't say enough good things about him. Um, but you know, how, how is he around your children? Oh, actually, I don't know. I just know he's a good person. I just know this is out there. Uh, because that's the second uh, step and then grooming the child uh, after they've had some kind of introduction to children or youth in the community. That's, that's when the abuse happens. Um, so think about what you're hearing about this person and, and their process of getting to know people as well. Uh, so in the interview, um, you may hear about uh, focus on personal needs, red flag. So someone who describes their desired match specifically, or had a, a major life change, um, or if they've been matched, they want to terminate the position suddenly without reason. Okay, uh, the next step, this is, uh, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because, um, you know, again, this is very technical and this is uh, just one step of the process. Um, I know most programs do say that they do some kind of background check. Um, we do recommend fingerprint-based rather than name-based. I found out from someone who is a professional uh, background screener that after Hurricane Katrina, uh, the government reissued new social security numbers and cards to a number of people who lost theirs. And I had, I had no idea that they could even do that. Um, but you may end up finding someone who has a false name or a false social security number, um, and even though fingerprinting is not 100%, um, at least it is more, uh, more reliable than name or, or social security number. Uh, and it goes through the FBI sometimes, depending on where you're located, it may go through your state or you may approach them directly. Um, obviously, you'll see some problematic background indicators in a uh, criminal history background check. Um, you can see some of these things here. Uh, obviously, you would not see something about uh, if they applied or they weren't accepted or they didn't like other uh, local youth serving programs. And sometimes you'll see this with volunteers who say, oh, I'm on their waiting list. 
um, I, they just haven't found the right match for me. And that could be the program's way of, of not uh, rejecting somebody outright, but it could also be the applicant's way of saying, uh, or of not saying that he was rejected from the program. Uh, Mentor has a great program called Safety Net. And in their pilot, um, they came up with some really good research statistics. When they did uh, the first 50,000 background checks, they found that 6.1% of those had a criminal record of concern. And out of those 6.1%, 50% of those people said that they didn't have a background, uh, didn't, didn't have any kind of record. Um, and do you know why they might have said something like that? Let's go for a little interaction here in our webinar. Uh, if you have any ideas as to why, why they would lie about that, uh, Arlene, if you could type that in. See what you come up with? Exactly. They didn't think uh, that you'd actually follow through with the check. And that's what happens most of the time, uh, is that programs are not checking. Uh, and you can get more information, I should say, about Safety Net. You can apply to become a program. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the Mentoring Partnership has lots of information about that. It's a great program, and it's continuing to be funded. Um, so if, if that's the, the easiest way for you to go to get that information, um, I'm very, very happy that it's around. Um, but also, just so you know, on the other side of things, um, information that you get from these background checks may be erroneous or incomplete. Uh, this is from a, a study from the National Association of Professional Background Screeners. Uh, they found that a large number of, of missed records and false positives were generated uh, when they did this study. So they missed almost 12% of the records that should have identified and uh, with the ones that they found that, that there were criminal records, 5.5% uh, of them were falsely attributed, attributed to those who were not convicted of a crime. So there's a, a large uh, uh, possibility of human error when you do this. And the other thing is that most of the time, um, anyone who is doing this kind of behavior, they've already, uh, already offended, uh, already molested, already assaulted a number of young people before they've actually been caught. Uh, so this was the same man. They think he molested um, upwards of you know, four or 500 young boys uh, before he was ever caught. Uh, and this is kind of a, a nice and scary way to look at it. Um, you're going to get information about people and just a couple top tiers, a very small number of people who are actually in the system. They've been convicted. They've actually been arrested. They've been investigated. They've even been accused or identified. And the, the majority of these uh, child molesters and, and child predators have never been accused or identified. So you're not going to find out that information from just a background check. Uh, sex offender registries, again, that's something good to check. Uh, you can go online to the Drew Sojin National Sex Offender Registry. You can also find out information from your state registry. If you do find uh, any kind of conviction, be sure to check in your state to see if there are any laws around um, if, if they can be rearrested because they've actually applied to become a volunteer in your program. Uh, these are the particular violations uh, codes in the state of California. Um, so if anyone says it's, you know, wants to volunteer, they go through the process and they have a record, they can actually be rearrested. Child Abuse History Registry, um, there's a, a national clearinghouse. Um, in some states, you may or may not have access to that kind of information. Um, so again, it's, it's just another tool. Um, again, it's just another tool but it does not guarantee the safety of youth in your program to go through these specific background checks. We want to make sure you're looking at a lot of other information. Uh, so this is one other tool, doing internet searches. Um, this is becoming a lot more popular with programs. Um, it's, it's free information. Uh, you may have to create an account sometimes, especially with um, Facebook or LinkedIn to, to look around for other people. Um, but think about you know, what people are putting out there about themselves. Uh, what kind of public information do they put out there? And um, it's also good to talk to your potential mentors about this to say, you know, if we found this information out about you, your mentee is going to, be, is going to find it a whole lot faster uh, and will, might possibly find more information about you as well. 
Um, so in terms of internet searches, you may not find out, you know, that there's a NAMBLA Facebook fan page, um, but you may see some interesting kind of connections and um, may, may bring up some more information for you. Uh, one thing you can find out is uh, another red flag, over-involvement with children. Uh, so if they're overly involved in teaching, scouting, church youth groups, um, something to pay attention to. And that doesn't mean, again, that someone who has a lot of activity with young people, uh, because that would be someone like myself, I've worked with young people for most of my career, um, that's not a red flag and that does not mean that I am a child molester. But it's something to pay attention to, especially if that person is not doing any other kinds of activities um, with anyone other than children. Uh, uh, employment and personal character references always great to do. You know, 99% of the time, these uh, these references come out just glowing and very positive. Um, but every now and then, you'll get someone who who does bring up something that will be important to know. Uh, maybe they hesitate as they give you information. Maybe they sound a little nervous. Um, always find out from them. Ask every every reference. Would you feel comfortable placing your own child? or a child you feel close to in the care of this applicant. And if somebody says no or isn't ready to say yes, absolutely, with no hesitation, something to pay attention to. And in our book, Safe, we have a sample volunteer mentor reference check. Something that you may find out when it comes to reference checks uh, is the red flag of under-involvement with adults. So maybe the references that they've given are people who don't know this person very well. Um, and what does that say about about the applicant? Um, that you, you know you're an organization that's putting together relationships, and if they can't produce evidence of solid social relationships, that's something to be really concerned about. DMV record insurance. Um, this is really good uh, a good tool to use, especially if you have uh, volunteer mentors who are driving uh, young people around. Um, if they're not Connecting that way, you may, you may feel like it's not important information, uh, but sometimes you may have some driving record uh, information that will show up here that may not show up on a fingerprint-based background check, um, especially when it comes to DUIs, um, DWIs. And we, had, we learned of a new, um, I had never heard of it before, uh, we had a, someone who had a wet and reckless violation. <laughs> so I do some uh, research to figure out that that meant uh, this person was just shy of the DUI uh, blood alcohol level, um, so they have this new category for it. So, something we learned. Uh, the Diana screen is a new online screening tool uh, that's produced from Able Screening. They've done a lot of work with convicted child molesters, um, and this is a, a really, really great tool. I can't emphasize it enough. Um, that helps to identify people who may be at sexual risk to children and also really kind of uh, assesses their, their ability to set boundaries and limits. Um, and that's important when it comes to sexual risk. Um, and it's a very interesting, uh, it's very fast, it's about 20 minutes for your applicants to take the test. Um, you do have to pay for it and it is not cheap, um, but we do recommend it as an additional tool um, that will can just kind of contribute overall to your process. And if you uh, need more information, go to their website. Um, we've been doing a pilot program with them for about six months. Um, and we have uh, had some, some applicants who failed the Diana screen that we were kind of surprised about. Um, so I recommend it highly. Pre-match training, um, I hope everybody is doing this. Um, and tr you know, it gives, the chance to, uh, gives you the chance to inform your mentors about what they're getting into. Uh, and, and sharing their roles and responsibilities and all the program information you need. But this is also a great opportunity to, to see how people interact in a group environment. Um, and I'm telling you, if you have somebody in there who's inappropriate, everybody else in that training knows, and everybody else is responding to that person. Um, so always a good, good uh, rule to have training before the match uh, so you can check them out as well. And in our book, we have a volunteer code of conduct sample and roles and responsibilities form sample for you to use. One thing that you might see in a training is the red flag of unhealthy attitudes. Um, they may say something about um, kind of inferring 
how they would uh, treat this child um, or maybe talk to them about certain kinds of things. Um, that's definitely what we would call unhealthy attitude that could come up in training. The final decision. This is what we talked about um, where you're bringing together all the information you've gotten from all these tools, um, any kind of reactions people have had to applicants, um, even if you know, you're really just you're not sure. Um, really examine those closely uh, and, and know that it's okay, hopefully, that your, your program will set up this policy to say, if anybody feels uneasy, then we will not accept this person. And there's a difference between maybe feeling like, you know, this person may, was a little boring um, or maybe it's not someone I really want to get to know, uh, but they could still be a, a really effective or good enough mentor for a young person. Uh, for maybe even a specific young person. But if somebody feels uneasy or just that they're, they're not going to work in the program, really pay attention to that because you're saving that young person from a failed relationship and you're saving your staff from having to put in a lot of time uh, to deal with this, with this uh, failed relationship as well. And in our book we have a sample volunteer rejection form that you can use. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, um, in terms of final decision, these are the kinds of things that you're looking to gauge. Um, what's their presence like? Um, do, they, do they seem to be pretty stable with where they are, with their, uh, with their housing, with their job? Um, what is their attitude towards young people? Um, how are they behaving? How did they behave during the training? Um, what kind of things did they talk about in the interview? Um, what, what, if any, kind of preferences did they state? Uh, you know, someone saying, uh, you know, I, I think I do, I'd, I'd probably work better with younger children versus t older teenagers is different from someone saying, I'd really like to be matched with an 11-year-old boy um, who has uh, kind of dark hair, maybe a lean build. That's, I think that would be the best match for you. You may think I'm exaggerating, but we've actually had people who, who said that in, uh, in interviews about, about their preference. Uh, and then also looking at those permanent disqualifiers and mitigating circumstances. And this is where you bring it all together to make that final decision. Um, and I hope that you'll feel that um, it's okay to reject a volunteer. I know that there's a lot of young people waiting for mentors, uh, but you want to make sure you're giving them the, the right person. Ongoing monitoring and rescreening re is very important to do. And I know I spent a lot of time on the application process, um, but Take the time, uh, whether it's twice a month, once a month, uh, or even weekly, to check in with both the mentor, the mentee, and the family, uh, or maybe a school official to find out what do you think this is like? How's it going? Uh, making sure that those people know that they can tell you if something wasn't right. You may see uh, another red flag in terms of lack of balance. Uh, being overinvested, giving lots of gifts, or problematic personal interests um, where they, they're just kind of hanging out a lot. They're not really doing things. Um, it's not often that children will complain about watching too much TV, uh, <clears throat> but if they do, it's something to pay attention to. Okay, um, I know we're getting towards the end of the time, and I just want to go through some of these ideas really quickly. Uh, teamwork is really crucial when you're talking about the screening process uh, because everybody needs to be working together. Everyone needs to feel you know, pretty grounded and settled and ready to go into an interview, uh, ready to lead a training so that they're really noticing what they need to pick up on. Uh, and then also that they're comfortable sharing with each other what, how they feel. Um, that it's in our program, it's an absolute policy that if somebody feels uneasy, then that person is not accepted. And there's no attempt to try to change that person's mind. Um, we definitely do ask people to try to, uh, to articulate what they're feeling or, or their suspicions, uh, but no one tries to convince them otherwise and, and tries to talk them out of it. Um, decide how often to meet and debrief. Um, minimally, it's for that final decision. We've often found that it's really helpful to maybe have some informal time, especially if somebody comes back from an interview and they're just really unsure about it or immediately they have, they picked up on things that they really want to process. Um, so, so figure out ways to work that into your, your schedule. 
um, make sure that your agency has some kind of process for uh, letting people talk about their, their feelings about applicants. Um, making sure that, that the agency really supports people being able to talk about their informed intuition. In terms of staff training, um, I hope that uh, you as programs have some kind of process set up for new people coming in and even for ongoing training for experienced staff. Uh, making sure that they have child abuse and mandated reporter training, uh, initial shadowing of other staff, making sure they understand how to document uh, what it's, what's happening in the process, uh, making sure that you have a resource list of services available in your community, uh, and making sure that you share whatever kind of research and literature is available on child molesters so they can continue to be uh, informed of the, the process. Supervision. Uh, I come from a, a counseling background. I'm a, I'm a therapist. Uh, supervision is really uh, one of the, the, the hallmarks of being able to, to do a good job. Uh, and I would really like to see more supervision happen in our programs uh, so that people, younger staff, will kind of know what to do with what they're feeling, what they're thinking, what they're seeing. Um, really good to, to also bounce ideas off of because uh, we've had n numerous discussions with uh, staff. I actually have gone on and I, I will go out and do uh, interviews with, with uh, applicants, with new staff with me so they can kind of see what I'm seeing and, and start to look back at what I picked up on. Uh, and that's really, really important. Uh, and then really learning from failure. Uh, I know it's hard to go through a termination. Um, it's really, it's, it's not what we want. You know, we want the successful year or successful five years or ten years um, or even successful nine months. Uh, but if something doesn't work, really take the time to go back and look and see was there something that we didn't see? Was there something that we overlooked? Uh, was there something that we didn't ask? Was, the, was it related to information that never would have come up in our screening process, and now we have to figure out a way to find out about that? Um, what are you going to do in the future? OK, and if, at this point, if anyone doesn't think that this training applies to your program, because you work closely with well, a well-known company or organization, uh, because your volunteers meet in a closely supervised environment, uh, because you really know your volunteers and you feel good about them, uh, or maybe because you feel like the young people in your program would tell you if something was wrong, then I would just challenge you to imagine your worst case scenario. Could you look back and defend your process? And if you can, then I think you're doing everything that that you know what that you know to do, uh, and that's a way to protect yourself. Uh, if you see the need to add more steps, more parts of the application process, then um, absolutely go back, take a look, figure out what you could implement easily. I know resources are always tight, uh, especially when it comes to time, um, but figure out how can you make this work for everybody. And I'll leave you with uh, the starfish story. I'm sure everyone has. Um, heard, heard of this. I'll let you go ahead and read that. And this is also a great, uh, great activity to include in your mentor training at the end um, to let people know why they're doing this. And, and how important it is to make a difference. And I like to include this in my trainings to let you know that I really appreciate you uh, being willing and open to learn more about this, this process um, and that because of, of your willingness and openness to this information, you are going to make the difference to of the life of a young person in your program because you're going to be screening uh, for the right applicants for them. Okay, and then to wrap up, um, this is uh, on the, the flyer that I think Arlene will be handing out to you about our book. Um, you can order our book, SAFE, online. And if you use the promo code SAFE Mentor, there's no spaces, it's all caps, uh, you'll get 20% off the $25 price. And just another little plug that we have a conference coming up in January. January 27th and 28th. It's going to be at the Oracle Conference Center, which is here. It's just south of San Francisco. 
uh, and Jean Rhodes is our keynote speaker. So I think that's it for the presentation. Um, be sure to come and check out our website. You can uh, follow us on Facebook or Twitter, and we have a blog that comes up too. Um, and I did ask Arlene uh, to forward on information about you so I can add you to our email list and track uh, programs that I've been training. And I see here a question. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you, uh, you referenced statistics on the effectiveness of mentoring. Why doesn't research show that mentoring relationships or programs are effective? Uh, I'm not sure I totally understand that question. Uh, there is uh, there is some research um, that is showing uh, effectiveness in certain kinds of areas um, when they're looking at specific outcomes when it comes to um, if I have another I do have other presentations where they're looking at specific outcomes for youth uh, especially uh, when it comes to academic achievement and that mainly has to do with uh, openness to learning and um, you know fewer missed days of school rather than higher grades um, and then also mostly uh, research has looked at uh, young people who've been, been involved uh, with the juvenile justice system so they're seeing um, that some mentoring programs uh, have have an impact of less um, of a few of less involvement within the juvenile justice system. Is that kind of what you were talking about here? Okay. And if you are interested, I um, I do have some other uh, I do have another presentation that's really about um, kind of the overall uh, effectiveness of mentoring programs and successful practices and things like that that kind of goes into that a little bit more. Um, and there's some really good information coming out. There's a new new directions on youth mentoring publication uh, that's put out by um, oh, I think it's Wiley and Sons. I think that's the publisher. Um, and it has it's a whole uh, it's a whole uh, journal, very small journal that has the newest research on youth mentoring in it. And it's edited by Mike Karcher and Mike Nicola. Um, and they it has some really good information in there too. So um, I think it is available now. For, it's, it has been published over the summer, so it is available. You can look it up. Okay, so um, thank you. And Arlene's typing in. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to share this info with us, especially so early in the AM. So I hope, uh, hope my voice came through okay. I, I am a little tired, but uh, I think it went well. And uh, any other questions in terms of SAFE or screening? Okay, Arlene says everything was great, and we'll be in touch later. So thank you so much for listening to this uh, presentation. And uh, please be sure to contact me if you have any other questions and to go online and, and see what we have available. Um, so thanks very much, and I hope you all have a great day.